This is the end of Mr. Asia in the aftermath. So, October 1979, two amateur divers, Jeffrey Ashcroft and Ian Reading. Wait, sorry, interrupt. I've actually completely forgotten the last bit of part one. <laughs> I've completely forgotten. <clears throat> uh, in the year 1979, Terry and Karen were travelling to the UK where the next part of the operation was due to begin. At the time, Terry was a heavy, heavy gambler. Massive cocaine addiction, uh, delusions, and paranoia. And Marty was flying first class, fucked up, and lost a lot oh, of money. Oh, and it was the drug dealer line that you said. You can't be a drug dealer if you're a drug user. Yeah, okay, no, cool. And um, that was the beginning of the year. Cool, we're on the same okay. page now. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> That's a good quick recap. Yeah. So, um, so two amateur dri- di- divers, Jeffrey Ashcroft and Ian Reading, arrived at... Asia? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, you've got it in front of you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't say the quarry's name. So, a water filled quarry yeah. in the English country of Lancashire. Something else. Oh, yeah. Okay, I don't know England. what that is. So, now we're yeah. in England. Okay. So, we started in New Zealand and then we were in Aussie and now we're in England. Okay. And at some point we were in Singapore. Yeah. So, just over 30 feet below the surface. There is a sandstone ledge. On that ledge, they found a body. Ooh. The body was found with a blue stone medallion with a Chinese symbol inscribed on it, which meant long life. Obviously didn't work, did it? (laughs) No. So when they found the body, it was naked and anchored in the water with industrial weights and a hydraulic lorry jack. They... Dubbed the unknown body as the Chinese puzzle. So it's Chinese Jack. No. Oh. <laughs> the, 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 Sorry. <laughs> no, so with the Chinese symbol. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they're being racist. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, I don't think they were. Okay. But um they just you know, That's they've got no a, they've got to name everything. Okay, yeah. So the body was found with no hands and the face and jaw had damage. Mm -hmm. So when the body was first found, Ashford said that they thought it was a tailor's dummy. So like a mannequin, dressmaker's mannequin. Okay. um, Imagine dying and then being mistaken for a dummy. The audacity. (laughs) Generally they don't have arms though. We didn't have hands, so is that... (laughs) Um, so it was only when they got closer they found out it was a body with no hands. Yeah, wow. The body was not identifiable. Hmm. When um, it was found, they knew it was more than it, they knew it was more than just a murder. It yeah. was a gangland style hmm. execution. Hmm. The victim was a powerfully built male, hmm. aged between Have a baba. Baba. <laughs> <laughs> aged between twenty five and thirty five. At 1.88 metres tall. I think that's wrong. Uh, he was suntanned and had good teeth. A neatly <laughs> trimmed moustache and shoulder length brown hair. Wait, question. So if he had teeth, how come they couldn't identify him from his teeth? Because they were damaged. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> when the body was found, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So... The body was found with severe stomach stab, uh, severe stomach stab, so it'd been <laughs> stabbed in the stomach, <laughs> and had a uh, had two head shot wounds. The body was left handless, preventing any fingerprint identification, and they had attempted to smash out the teeth, but did limited damage as a cloth was paced, placed over the face before it was bashed. Oh, okay. So any- why won't they just take the cloth off before smashing him? Oh, that's emotional, isn't it? Oh, okay. No, yeah, that's fair. So anything that could have been used to identify the person was gone. So not knowing who the person was and with nothing to identify them with, a death mask was made and published in papers hoping to find any information. You know what a death mask is? No. So when someone dies, they make a, like, 
what looks like their face. Yeah, of. they um, like plaster their face and okay. get an impression of their face. Okay. Okay, no, that makes sense. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah I didn't want to ask because I didn't want to sound stupid. I was thinking it. I was like, what is I a death it. mask? I oh, okay. It's in the Mangataipu murders as well. Oh, cool. Um, three cars were also pulled from the quarry and forensically checked. This was a very common place for stolen cars to be dumped. Right. To the point where, where the quarry was drained in 1999. Where's the whole quarry was drained? Yep. You said it was quite a big one though, right? Yep. Oui. So in 1999, hundreds of cars were found below the water. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> um, shortly after the body was found, the police launched a murder inquiry in which that involved more than 80 officers. I'm sorry for my wording today. I seem to be a wee no, bit I'm listening. pooped. <laughs> so Tuesday the 16th of October, it was revealed that the man had been shot in the head and it was believed that he had be, it had been done at close range, most likely using a revolver. Mm. According to the pathologist... The man had also had se- oh my God, the man also had several knife wounds to the stomach, and his hands had been hacked off after death. So it was another one, another murder that was the same. No, this is still the, the same, same murder. One. Okay. Yeah. So Rimmer, who was a lead investigator on the case, could not rule out the possibility of the medallion that the medallion had been placed around the victim's neck as yeah. a joke by the killers. Yeah, well, it makes sense, though. Like yeah, they that's wouldn't... a lull, though. Eh? Yeah, well, no, but... Well, it is a lull, but also why would you leave anything that identifies them on the body? <laughs> yeah. So the police were heavy to follow the lead of the medallion, thinking this would lead to the arrest of the killer. The police followed the trail of the symbol and visited several special specialty shops in Liverpool to try and source it. They came out with nothing. Oh. <laughs> with few results. With few results. So, they definitely focused too heavily on the medallion. Mm. So, a team of officers visited Walton, Gallo and Liverpool, hoping gangland killers or criminals could shed light on the victim, but no one narked. Well, like what happened to their other couple, snitches, that narked, their stitches, and they yeah. die. Yeah. So at the end of October, every police force was circulating images of the man found in the quarry. So the mask, the death mask. Yeah. Okay, yeah. On October 26th, Rimmer told the media he was surprised no one had recognised the victim's distinctive looks and suggested he might have changed his appearance to avoid detection. Well, probably because the mask was just shittily made. <laughs> yeah, maybe because he was dead. Yeah. <laughs> And who knows, he might have had a swollen face by that point as well. Like, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. So back in England... Oh, Paul, sorry, interrupting again. Annie had his face smashed in, like, with yeah. his teeth. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, understandable that no one could... Yeah. So back in England, police had a breakthrough on November the 2nd, almost three weeks after the body was discovered, when a former beauty queen, Julie Hugh, and her friend, Barbara Pilkington... Barbara Pilkington mm. walked into Leyland Police Station and told police who the dead man was. Oh. Are you ready for this? They identified the man as 27 year old Marty Johnson. Oh, the syndicate. Johnstone. The syndicate dude. Yep. Oh. From New Zealand. Oh, wow. Who was Hugh's boyfriend. Oh, the, the beauty. Yeah, the beauty queen. Yeah, yeah. So she'd been on holiday in Spain with Pilkington with John, John Stone. No, I just read that. John... It should be Johnson. Yes, yeah, and say, it's that's not Marty, Johnson. Eh? That's Marty. It's John Stone. But that's Marty. Eh? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Marty. So when Marty was mur- uh, she'd been in Spain when Marty was murdered. Yeah. She was told he was on business in New York and couldn't be contacted, but had grown suspicious and then alarmed when he failed to call her on her twenty-second birthday. Oh. Hugh also told police that her boyfriend had met his fate at the hands of one. Andrew Mayer from Leyland. Oh, his name sounds familiar. What was Andy. he? Andy. What, what was he, though? In he was the Hitman. like original oh. OG with Marty that oh. would go around in the boat and get it out of the... Oh. No, that was Terry, wasn't it? No. Oh, okay. So carry Terry on. was later. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Um, when police spoke to the Mirror who's a magazine or something, mm. they told them they were 99.9% sure that the body was 
Maoris and described him as a New Zealand businessman dealing in drugs. Right, okay. Already they were forming theories about a power struggle going wrong and reported that they had held 28 people from across Lancashire, Lang, Lancashire <laughs> under suspicion of murdering Marty. I know I'm saying that wrong, but just oh, well, bear yeah. with me. November 5th, after Marty was ident- uh, November 5th, days after Marty was identified, armed police were used to protect five men who appeared briefly in Corley Magistrates Court to answer on charges of killing Marty. So this case became one of the most expensive and heavily guarded in British history. Yeah. November 8th, while searching a river in Scotland, police found a severed right hand which a pathologist later identified as the hand to be Marty's, following the police to formally identify the victim. I wonder why they didn't chop it up and then just feed it to the fishes. Yeah. I mean, they tried to feed it to the fishes. Yeah, but they tried to feed a whole hand to a fish. I don't know. I mean, if I were them, I'd be a little bit smarter about it. Okay. Yeah, I'd definitely be smarter about it, especially after doing I, all this podcast stuff. I was stuff. just going to say, yeah, I probably wouldn't murder him in the first place. No. But, you know, <laughs> a ball has got a ball. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go back and we'll talk about what led to Marty's death. Yes, please, yeah. <clears throat> so when Marty failed with the drug deal in Thailand, Terry planned to take Marty out. Shock, horror. Mm, yeah. He, contract, he contacted Marty and asked him to come to Scotland as they were beginning their Scotland expansion. Okay. They sound like they're building a mansion or something. Yeah, they're building an empire. <laughs> they did. Yeah. <laughs> so Marty met with Andy and his cousin Jimmy Smith. Um, Andy, who was only 26 at the time, was tasked with the killing and Jimmy was sent to help with the hiding of the body, fearing for the safety of his wife and daughter if he refused to kill him. Right. Other associates were also roped in to source a weapon and help cover their tracks. Russell, who was from London, supplied the gun. Mm. The gun had been brought into London in a shoebox by a 16-year-old, Karen Pigeon, the daughter of one of Clark's Terry's chauffeurs. Mm. Kirby, who was from Clayton, Brooke, was one of Andy's friends from school, supplied the weights and the rope used to hold the body underwater. While this was happening in the background, Terry was put in touch with a Glasgow contact who could supply him. Uh, Scotland would become Britain's heroin capital pin in the 1980s. Mm. And they missed out on this because Terry fucked up and killed someone. Oh no. (laughs) Terry! (laughs) Don't kill people! He always violent, got lots of violent tendencies, doesn't he? Doesn't he? From part one. Yes. So, <laughs> so understandable. They drove up on the A6 on the pretense of driving to Scotland and securing a drug deal. Hmm. On the way, the three stopped near Crathorn, north of Lancaster. Location is still not exact. Got out of the car, and he turned to Marty and shot him. Two times in the head at point blank range. Which was just what the police said, eh? That, yeah. yeah they did. Marty started to gurgle, so Andy repeatedly stabbed him in the stomach. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Andy and Smith took the body back to Andy's garage in Robin Hay, Leyland. They butchered the body using an axe to slice off the Marty's hands, hands yeah. before taking a lump hammer to smash out his teeth. Mm-hmm. They did not manage to do much damage to his teeth as they put a cloth over his face. Yeah. So they slashed open his stomach, making sure he wouldn't float, and tied the weight to the body. Mm. They folded the body into Andy's jag and drove to the quarry and threw him in. Yeah. Where Marty became became tangled on a diving guide and landed on a ledge about 30 metres deep in the water. I just want to quickly skip ahead. Because there's a fun fact in there. I don't know. Oh, well. Right. <clears throat> so, the arrest. Yeah. Andrew Mayer, Andy, was arrested when he arrived back in Heathrow Airport and eventually pled guilty to murder. Terry, 
who it emerged was already wanted for five murders in Australia, was arrested during the early morning raid at his exclusive flat in Kensington. Mm -hmm. He was in bed with Karen and they were both high on drugs when armed officers burst in. Nice. How embarrassing. (laughs) Charlie Russell, who supplied the gun, was... It was brought into London by his daughter. Mm. How shit's that? Yeah. Keith Billy Kirby, who went to school in Preston with Andy, who brought the rope and weights to hold the body down. And Jimmy Smith, who confessed to his part in the killing and told police the hands of Marty had been thrown in a river near Livingston in Scotland, close to where he used to live. Okay. So, the five men appeared in court again, May 19th, 1980. But the formal trial didn't begin until January 1981. Okay. A hundred witnesses were called. The court was heavily guarded with police. So this was the most heavily guarded trial ever. Eight days into the trial, Andy admitted that he was given a kill or be killed ultimatum by Terry before he shot Marty. Mm -hmm. In April, Clark told the court he was no... uh, In April, Terry... Okay. Told the court he was no Lily White Angel, but he was not guilty of the crime. Mr. He, B.I.G. sticking up for himself. <laughs> he had not been pro- proven as Mr. Big at this point. Oh. But prosecutors in Britain and Australia were sure that he was Mr. Big right. and pushed this on the jurors. Right. So Terry attempted to bribe the police officers who interviewed him, offering With them one million. <laughs> oh, more than a cheeseburger, jeez. If they could give him. A getaway car. Wow. Did they do it? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. <laughs> July 15th, 81, 123 days after the trial had started, Terry was convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment with a 20-year recommendation. The judge described him as ruthless and dangerous. The same... Sorry? Well, I'm guessing by this stage, because he wasn't known as Mr. Big, supposedly, they weren't, he wasn't connected to the drugs. It was just the murder at this No, point. he was still connected to the drugs. But he's only been charged with murder. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Uh, the same sentence was given to Andy, while Smith, Kirby and Russell all received life sentences for their part. Not quite two years into his sentence, Terry died of what was recorded as... Drug overdose? <laughs> Yes. Oh, Um, okay. uh, No. (laughs) There has also been speculation that this could also be self-inflicted overdose or murder. Oh, okay. Um, The coroner's report, however, shows his heart exploded. So it probably could have been a drug thing then, couldn't it? Yes. Yeah. In the final weeks of the Mr. Asia Syndicate, Terry had not only ordered the murder of Marty, he was also after Jim Diamond Shepherd. Ooh, the banker. Yes. Jim had been tipped off by an associate, and he had planned to kill Terry first. (laughs) He said he could have disappeared overseas, but didn't want to look over his shoulder for the rest of his life. If someone wanted to kill him, he was going to kill them first. Oh my god. The day before Jim was planning to fly to England to do the deed, Terry was arrested. (laughs) (laughs) Timing (laughs) for the diamond, far out. The lifestyle that they lived was not as flashy as the film makes it out to be as there was a film done on it. Yeah. When Jim was arrested in 1986 for 15 years, he saw what the heroin he was selling was doing to people. People, while on remand in a holding cell, were talking about how they couldn't wait to get back to jail to get their fixed. Mm. It was a vicious, violent world where you could be... You, where you took to your competitors with a baseball bat and had to be prepared to kill because the other guy would kill you. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so the impact that the syndicate made, they started the silent epidemic in New Zealand, so hepatitis C from sharing needles. Oh. The Commonwealth of Australia launched an inquiry into matters relating to drug trafficking. So, man, that is a massive thing that you can read. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Um, so not proven, but potential murders that Terry committed as per Diamond Jim recounting. So gunning down two men in New Zealand around 1975. Four more people killed in 1977. Uh, Terry also recalled to Jim shooting two people from the ship 
Connor Pre, which was bringing 400 kilograms of heroin to Australia from Asia for the syndicate. But the crew asked for more pay, so he shot them. Oh, <laughs> Ollard and jo- Julie, which we know of. Um, Ollard is said to be the first person to die at Terry's hand. He buried them. Terry buried them. Yep, he buried yeah. them and later returned to remove their heads. Oh. <laughs> Jim is sure Terry killed his second wife, Norma, by overdosing her. Oh, the one with the heroine the, in the part one. Who died yeah. of suspicious circumstances. Yeah. So Harry Lewis, on the suspicion that he ratted to police, he paid $5,000. So this would be $30,000 today. Yeah. Just to get him out of prison. Yeah. To kill him. Oy. The Wilsons. Who were killed? Get him out of, sorry, I'm just <laughs> thinking that he got him out of prison so we could kill him. Yes. Nice. <laughs> so the Wilsons, who were killed by the hitman, they, uh, the way Terry found out about them narking, he was sold a record, a, a record of the confession for a hundred thousand mm. dollars. This is one week's wages for them. Yeah, that's nothing, eh? $550,000 today. Yeah. They were also potentially killed for stealing heroin from the syndicate. Yeah. Strong possibilities. Yeah. Terry killed Sydney, Sydney model and drug mule Maya Harrison. She was said to have wronged Allard. And then Terry was called on to do the deed because Allard couldn't. Right. So he was also said to have killed in either 76 or 77 um, Tibor Banfi. I think that's how you say it. I will be correct. Uh, incorrect. <laughs> I will be incorrect. I will be correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they had worked with Lewis running cannabis between uh, Bangkok and Singapore. So he not only killed all these people, but he killed the man who started his success. Ooh. And if you that's Google cold. <laughs> Yeah. And if you Google Mr. Asia, Terry Clark comes up. But okay. he is not Mr. Asia. Yeah. Mr. Asia is Marty Johnson. Yeah. Which would piss off Terry. Yeah, but sorry you're Terry. Not yeah. Shit. <laughs> yeah, well he's dead anyway. <laughs> well they both are. <laughs> yeah. So fiction's created about this event. So crime story. A British TV series, Underbelly, A Tale of Two Cities, Underbelly, New Zealand, Land of the Long Green Clouds. So that's obviously about cannabis. Yeah, because it's say Land of the Long White Cloud is us. So, that's <laughs> <laughs> so there's a song called Mr. Asia oh, yeah. by Graham Braz- Brazier. So there's two books that I've found, Mr. Asia, The Last Man Standing by Jim Diamond Shepherd. Oh, no way. And the Mr. Asia file by Pat Booth. And that's the stupid Jim Shepard one's the one that I missed out on. And I am gutted. Yeah, bugger. So, I just checked my writings and I wanted to say that in my research, when I mentioned that um, Marty became became tangled on a diving guide and landed on the ledge, if he had been 20 feet over... Yeah. He wouldn't have landed on the ledge, and it would have been unlikely his body would have been found for another 20 years. What? Yeah. Wow. How unlucky is that? Well, lucky. Lucky for the good people of the world, but... Oh, jeez. <clears throat> um, <laughs> That's crazy. What a cool... What a coinky dink. <laughs> <laughs> what a coinky dink. So positive in the math of this destruction. Yeah. So, um, a bit of a theory. So, Marty's death. Death death however disturbing was not unexpected Mm. Shepard believed part of the reason Clark wanted Marty dead was to take over his heroin distribution network in Sydney yeah Uh, Johnson uh, Marty had also established a network in England by taking Marty out Terry automatically took over this is what he'd done most of his career people would set up the market and he'd kill them and take over right he's a shit business partner (laughs) jeez yeah hell yeah so just a wee bit about the police corruption so the other extraordinarily (laughs) oh the other feature of the mr asia story was the police corruption in australia 
that allowed the syndicate to operate and thrive. In those days, the police in New South Wales and Queensland were completely corrupt, says retired judge. Completely corrupt? Yep. Wow. Retired judge, Mr Justice Stewart, the man given the job of later investigating drug trafficking in New Zealand and Australia. It was said at the time that you could buy the entire police force of Queensland and New South Wales for the price of a hamburger. (laughs) That's so bad. (laughs) That's awful. (laughs) And that was the rise, the fall, and the shit in between of the Mr. Asia Drug Syndicate. I honestly still can't believe I hadn't heard of that before. <laughs> Neither. That was crazy. It's not, like, again, it started in New Zealand. Like, they're from New Zealand. Yeah. Except Chinese Jack, obviously. Yeah. And then it grew from not just New Zealand. It was Australia, Sydney. Yeah, ba- Bangkok. Singapore. Yeah. Bangkok. All such a huge drug syndicate. I'm just thinking that fully reminds me of the George Wilder case I did because it's just so ridiculous. <laughs> like, oh, and it was Jim Diamond that was in prison with George Wilder. Oh, was it? Yes. Oh, did, and he, he, did he escape with him? Or? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he was the one that said that thing about him. Oh, um, so this is... The Diamond, the Jim banker. Shepard's... Um, the the banker dude. Yep. Yeah. His opinion on some of New Zealand's most ma- notorious oh, criminals. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So New Zealand's George Wilder, New Zealand's best known prisoner prison escaper. He was a burglar who left thank you and apology notes for his victims and became a folk legend for nu- numerous escapes from prison. In the early 1960s, he escaped from New, new Plymouth Prison for 65 days. And from Mount Eden for 173 days. In 1964, he again escaped to Mount Eden, this time with Giles. They hold up in. What? Hold up in a um, Mount Eden house, taking two police hostage. Through this, the pair gave themselves up. They got through a bottle of whiskey first. He was always out in about six months with his escapes. He used to go bush, and he was a character. (laughs) Nice. Yes, and then he talks also about John Giles, Ron Joggerson. So I'm guessing we should do... the Bassett Road Killings, which you're going to do anyway. The Bassett Road Killings. We've already done them, haven't we? No, that was Bassett Road Machine Gun Killings. Oh, have you? Are you gonna do that? I one? thought you were gonna do that. Well, I can do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Give so it to there's me. so John and Ron are both the um, killings. Oh no! Don't go into it. No, don't. No, I'm not. <laughs> and then Bruce McPhee, who we will also cover because okay. why not? Exactly. Oh well, that's interesting. What a again, New Zealand is a very small country, and everyone knows everyone, including the criminals. <laughs> Sometimes they bunk together. I don't know how it works, but yeah. Man, that's just... I I think it's so crazy. Like, it's such an insane case that something that big started in New Zealand. Yeah. Like, we've got masterminds as well. (laughs) (laughs) If that's what you'd like to call them. (laughs) I don't know if I'd call them masterminds. They're obviously not, otherwise they'd still be hustling. (laughs) Nah, that was a great case. That was really interesting. I I learned something today, yeah. Oh, I love it so much. I just think it's so... Yeah, it's very intriguing. It's incredible. Yeah. Anyway, I am Ayla. And I'm Andy. And this was Sinister, Sinister Dynasty. Dynasty.